Welcome. I'm glad you decided to spend some time with me in my pots and pans. I'd like to talk to you about Louisiana cooking. Louisiana food is two things to me. It's Cajun and Creole. Two completely distinctive things that develop side by side over the years. Cajun food is, is country food and Creole food is city food. Creole food is a food of the city of New Orleans. And the, the cities had seven flags flown over it, which means seven countries owned it. And each time they left someone behind. Well, those people were normally influential people. That's why they stayed. So they would have big houses with lots of servants. The most important person in that house, because entertainment is always a part of Southern tradition. It's a part of business. It's just a part of everything that's the South, was the cook. And the cook would work for a Spanish family, they had to cook for their taste. They'd work for a French family, they'd have to cook to, for their taste. So the idea was that over the years, these dishes are parts of this thing that, that the cook did, worked, just developed into wonderful dishes of food, like shrimp creole and uh, so many other stuffed eggplant and stuffed melaton. But you can see trends of Spanish and you can see French influence and Italian influence in all these dishes. And they taught it to their sons and daughters to become cooks. And so that's the way Creole evolved. Cajun food is different. Cajun food was evolved by the people coming from Nova Scotia into Louisiana and isolating themselves right here in the swamps, in the bayous, and living off the land and making do with what they had. We're here in Acadiana Village to give you a feeling of old Louisiana. Uh, the food and the music was the most important things that the Cajuns had to live every day off of. I mean, this was our entertainment, this was our life. The best cook in the neighborhood was the most important person in the neighborhood, and the musicians were what made it work. So this is where both of these kitchens or both of these kinds of cooking come from. If you came today to Louisiana and looked for them, it'd be very hard to find because they're only in the homes. They're not in the restaurants. So what we have today and what we're going to talk about, you and I, is Louisiana cooking, which is a combination of Cajun and Creole. One of my favorite dishes in the whole world is jambalaya. Jambalaya is one of those things and that just, when you talk about it, just makes the juices run in my mouth. I mean, it's just exciting to eat. And it's so simple. It, it's just, jambalaya was used when I was coming up. Mother would, we didn't have electricity, so we didn't have a refrigerator. We had an ice box where you'd put a chunk of ice in. And about the second or third day that you had leftovers uh, in the box, it started to get a little bit funny, a little bit tainted. It was still good to eat. And you had to eat everything because there wasn't a lot of food. But the, the mother would take all this stuff out of the icebox and put it all in a pot together. It could be anything, almost anything that you can imagine she would put in a jambalaya. There was one thing that was in every one of them, and it was some kind of smoked meat. She'd put sausage in it, or she'd put some kind of ham in it. The, the thing that made jambalaya distinctive is that it was a rice dish, and it was just incredibly hot. I love to eat hot, I mean, till it makes you scalp itch and it makes you sweat, you know, and it just makes you just really excited about eating. But we would take, she'd take whatever leftovers we had, put it in a pot, bring it up, make a good strong juice with it, and then put rice in and cook it. And the rice would make it bland out, just wonderful tasting, and the rice was, had a lot of flavor. And that's to me, when I think of jambalaya, what it is, you can put anything in it. Doesn't matter, it can be seafood, it can be pork, it can be chicken. But what we have for you today and what we'd like to show you how to, to cook is a chicken jambalaya. And it has sausage in it, which we call on doing in Louisiana, which means to me a pork smoked sausage, and tasso, which is Cajun ham, it's strips of pork that's just intensely seasoned. I mean, you just roll them in herbs and I'm sorry, you roll them in spices and sugar and salt, and then you age it and smoke it until it's just really reeking with flavor and just overwhelming with a sweetness of smoke. And this is tasso. You combine those with rice and a wonderful stock, and you have this incredible dish, which we call jambalaya, which I just happen to have right here with me. I love doing this kind of television, because you get to eat all the time. I mean, it's just wonderful. To, you know, the word jambalaya comes from three or four different words. It, 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 jumbo, which is the, the French call ham. They call it a jambo. So that's where the jumbo comes from. The, the ya, Y-A, comes from the African word for rice. 
and Allah, you know, the Cajuns, we always say Allah. So it's Jambalaya. Ooh. You know, cooking is a wonderful thing to do. And you should be creative. You should be yourself when you're cooking. And I'm going to tell you right now that I will never follow a recipe more than uh, a half a time, or actually not at all. So don't expect me to follow my own recipes when I do this. Now, we're starting out with, with a good hot fire, and this would be a normal fire at home, and butter and onions. And we want to take the onions and brown them, as you see it's happening here. Now, the reason we're browning the onions is to give them dimensions and taste and texture. Now, these onions are actually getting sweet by browning. You're taking the sugar out of the onion and you're bringing it to the surface and you're making it brown. And I mean this is not like dumping sugar in sweet, but this is a kind of sweetness that's going to make an ultimate difference in the taste. Now we've added the tasso to it and the tasso is a Cajun ham that has, uh, we literally take this ham and, and we take strips of pork and we roll it in sugar and salt and and peppers and we age it and smoke it and just I mean the, this is a highly seasoned a uh, lot of taste ham but we still increasing the taste by our cooking method now we're browning the ham with the onions now anybody who's ever had a piece of ham that's just been sliced off and eaten cold or that's been browned know the difference in the taste when you brown it you just accent the taste of pork I mean you just make it taste wonderful and this is what's happening here now we're adding onions again and we're adding bell pepper and celery, which we in Cajun country call the holy trinity of Cajun and Creole cooking, the onions and bell pepper and celery. And we're going to add a little bit of tomato sauce to it. Now, at this step, what we've done is we've taken onions, we've put them in, and we've got the sweetness out of them, and now they're getting very soft, so we have a taste and a texture the first time we put the onions in. We added the tasso to start the flavor building, to start the dehydration of the pork and the browning of the pork and the collection of the juices on the bottom of the pot. Now we're adding a mixture of herbs and spices into it. And the second, onions, bell pepper, and celery, and tomatoes. And we're going to let this cook together. The reasoning behind this is just really simple. I'm trying to build the ultimate in taste, and I'm trying to build on the bottom of the pan a crust. And the crust is going to be a combination of all these juices. And the third thing that you that, that is absolutely necessity to get food to taste the ultimate is to have these taste changes and the texture changes. Now I'm going to add the sausage to it. Adding the sausage at this point is again bringing another, another element into it. And we're going to re-add everything another time. But let's watch for a second. Isn't that beautiful? Now the juices are coming together. I mean, you can see it coming together. They're getting thick and things are browning and just really working. This is cut up raw chicken that we're adding to it because it's a chicken jambalaya. Now, you don't want to just put the chicken in. We believe, I believe, that you got to season everything every step of the way. And you've seen put seasoning meat, we didn't season. But when we put vegetables that wasn't seasoned, we added seasoning to it. We put unseasoned chicken, and now we're adding seasoning to it. Now it's time to add the bay leaves. It's time to add the garlic. And we're approaching the, the final steps. Or we're approaching the conclusion of the dish. And what I mean by that is the conclusion of the taste, not the conclusion of the cooking. Because we don't want to overcook the chicken. That's why we put it in so late. Uh, we want to let everything else get the maximum of taste, the maximum of ability to taste, and then add the chicken to it because you want the chicken to stay nice and moist and you don't want to cook it a long time. The juice from the chicken, the sausage, the tasso, and all the vegetables is now going to start collecting on the bottom. When you see the smoke coming up from the pan, it's evaporation is happening. When this evaporation happens, it leaves a sort of, uh, you can see it there, it, it leaves a, uh, things to stick on the bottom. They're like little pieces of uh, uh, almost, we call them dregs, but little pieces of goodness. And those things, when they brown, they're not only sweet and delicious and a combination, thundering combination of taste, 
but they're also thick. I mean, they have gelatin in it. There's no flour in this. There's no nothing to make this thick except the juices that are there in the bottom of the pot that evaporated and left this brown crust. And when you leave this brown crust on and you put water or stock in it, when it comes up, it comes up thick. Now for the last and final time, we're adding onions and bell pepper and celery. Now we have three times onions uh, in it. We have two times bell pepper and celery in it. And we have two different kind of tomatoes. We added tomato sauce. Now we're adding uh, uh, fresh tomatoes. So you see we've taken this very economical, very simple dish that we call jambalaya and we've staged ingredients. We've put them in one at a time and we've gotten the ultimate taste out of each one of these ingredients. Now we're going to bring them together with starch and we're adding rice to it. Now rice is very, very bland, so we season the rice a little bit. But the, 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 the real thing that's going to make the rice work and make this a valuable dish is all the juices that we've concentrated and that we've added stock to these juices and brought them up. Isn't that pretty? God, I can taste it. We brought them up and all this is going to get into the rice. And then the starch from the rice is going to get into the dish itself. And those combinations of bland and seasoning is going to just make this spectacular dish to eat. You hear it sticking on the bottom and getting that up from the bottom the final time of getting the ultimate taste out of it. You gotta scratch the bottom. I mean that's where the goodness is. It sticks on the bottom. Finish adding the stock. I'm gonna add just a few more tomatoes to it also. The onions and bell pepper that we've added the last time still got color to it. Now we're going to add a few tomatoes so the color will be there. Then we're going to cover it, let it simmer for a few moments. And you have jambalaya! <laughs> Hot on the heels of black and red fish, you know, you think, God, this is good. Maybe we'll work with something else. And one day I had a prime rib and it had been cooked and then it was left over from, from the previous day. And I cut a steak out of that and did the blackening method with it. And <clears throat> I kind of felt sorry for the rest of the world while I sat there and just hogged out on this steak. I mean, it was so wonderful. And which created a whole new method of cooking for us. Uh, and we call it black and prime rib. And what we do is we take the fat cap of a rib and we lift it up. And we take a knife and punch holes in the surface at the top of the, of the prime rib. Then we layer it, literally layer it with seasoning. Then we put the fat cap back on and get an oven just as hot as you can get it. Seven, eight hundred degrees, whatever it'll get and put this, the prime rib in there and it just literally burns the fat off of it. And in that method of burning the fat off, it drives the seasoning through and the fat is what really has the taste on it. So it gets down into those holes you made, but it doesn't cook the prime rib, it leaves it rare. And after, after, you've, after the fat has been burned, you take it off, scrape the seasoning off and cut it into steaks. And then take the steak and do the blackening method with it. You get an iron skillet, you make it hot. When it gets really hot, you put the steak and butter on both sides and you sprinkle seasoning on it and then you drop it in that skillet. And when you do so, it's gonna be incredible. I mean, the smoke is gonna fly. You know, the fire is gonna flame up and it's just, I mean, it's just wonderful to, just to watch it. But what happens is when you do that, you're gonna start evaporating the meat juices from the surface and meat has sugar in it 
and the sugar is going to start caramelizing and the seasoning is going to start caramelizing, the butter is going to start caramelizing and you're going to develop this crust and it's going to be a crispy crust and this crust is going to be kind of sweet, it's going to be kind of smoky, kind of bitter and in the center of the meat you can leave it rare, medium rare, any way you like it. I mean this is the first cooking method that actually makes a piece of meat taste different. Normally you either have a better steak or not as good a steak and that's it, I mean that's where you get with beef. But with this cooking method, you start out by roasting it, and then you end up by blackening it, and it's just the most incredible tasting. I mean, it just drives me nuts, and it just drives me so nuts that I've got one right here. I mean, and I'm going to quit being nuts because I'm going to take a bite of this. See how black it is? And that nice crust on it? Oh, a little bit of brown garlic butter on top of it. Mmm. Oh, I feel bad for you. Oh. Do you like a bite? I got a bite here for you. Yeah, take one. Mmm. Probably the hardest thing to really have an effect on is beef and especially a roast. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do a roasting process that actually has a taste effect on the meat itself. I mean, it, it's not a dramatic effect. I mean, it won't change the whole thing prime roast is, but it's going to have that little bit of taste that's going to give you a change, and it's going to give you this wonderful whiff of stuff. Now, what we're doing here is we're punching holes in the top of the prime rib. Then we're going to add seasoning to it. Now, by doing that, some's going to get in the holes, not a great deal, but we're going to put the fat cap back on, and when we put the fat cap back on, we're going to put it in the oven. Now it's going to take probably uh, a half hour to 45 minutes in the oven and we want the oven to be as hot as it possibly can be. The object of what we're trying to achieve is to burn the fat without cooking the meat. And hopefully those holes in there will receive all this wonderful juice that's, that's coming from the fat. Now here, see, see this brown stuff on top? This has been in the oven for about 45 minutes. We've taken it out. We're pulling all the seasoning off the top, cutting the excess fat off because we want to cut it into steaks. And here we are cutting it into a steak, and you'll see that the inside, even though it looks like a prime rib that's been cooked, the inside is still absolutely raw. I mean, it's absolutely raw, but it's starting to take on a roast flavor, and it's starting to take on the first dimensions in taste. Now, we're ready to cook it. We're going to put it in butter, turn it over, we're going to add seasoning to it. Now, you need a little more seasoning here than you do with fish, or if you do with a thinner piece of meat, because this is a thick piece of very strong tasting prime rib. I mean, you need to put some seasoning on it to have an influence. So we're going to coat it a little bit on this side, turn it over, put some on the other side, and then we're going to start the blackening method. Now the blackening method for this is is just, you need this hot pan, see the smoke? I mean, you can't do it in the house, you got to do it outside. I mean, this, this puts out an incredible amount of smoke. But what we want to do is uh, just get that, oh, let's look at it. I love this scene. It's almost moving. What's happening is that you're taking the best parts of the juices of the beef and the seasoning and the butter and making them brown on the surface and you're forming a crust to give you incredible dimensions and taste. You see the, the black starting to form on there? Now if you take it too far it's going to be burned. But what you want to do is just blacken it, not burn it, to make it just taste incredible. It's almost like it's holding the steak up above the bottom of that cutaway skillet. That's edible. From watching that, you would think there's nothing you'd possibly want to add to this. But let me tell you something. Brown garlic butter sauce is something that'll just almost raise the taste of anything you put it with. And it's a very simple thing to do, and it's very quick, and you do it at the last minute. You take a skillet, and you make it hot. And it's preferably, you make it hot without anything in it, just empty. And then you add some chunks of whole butter into it. 
and then you just sit there and just sort of stir it, which still only takes a few seconds until you start developing a brown spot in the center. See that brown spot in the center? And it's starting to get brown also on the sides. Now we're going to add garlic to it, and then we're going to add a little bit of parsley to it, and then we're going to add a wonderful thing that ties it together, or two uh, wonderful things actually, and there goes the, the, the reduction or the glaze. This is a beef glaze and another little piece of butter and a little Lee and Perrins. And shaking this, we actually turn this into a sauce that'll give a steak or a piece of fish or anything you put it with a third and fourth and tenth dimension that you can hardly get anywhere else. And what you want to do is you want to let this brown together and you want to let it foam up and rise. And you can see how the foam's coming up now and it's getting close to being ready. Now see how it's wonderful color brown? And you can just pour it on top of a steak or you put it in a dish and serve it with dinner. It works for roast, it works for anything. It's just wonderful. Gumbo is the most historical dish in Louisiana. I think that it has, it has more meaning to me than anything else that I cook. Perhaps jambalaya has almost as much, but gumbo really does. When, when we had problems with not enough food, mother made a gumbo. When we had uh, too many mouths to feed from company and, and the gumbo always made it work because gumbo is a sauce and it's rich and it tastes good and it satisfies your hunger. Um, I can remember the times when uh, I was growing up, my brothers and sisters were going to the dance, they would stop by the house on Saturday night and they would leave off their children, mother and I babysat. <clears throat> One of the things we always did was fix a pot of gumbo because when they would come home at two or three o'clock in the morning that would be something for them to eat. We had a wood-burning stove. We simply just pushed the gumbo in the back of the stove after it was made, and it was just spectacular. What you have with a gumbo, when you talk about cooking it, is you have a just spectacular multiple taste that's really unusual, especially if you don't know anything about Louisiana food. You take flour and oil, and you cook it to such an incredibly hot temperature. We're talking five, 600 degrees till the flour actually starts to brown. Then you season that flour and oil by putting onions and bell pepper and celery and mixed herbs and spices into it. Once that happens, you have the start. And we always say in Louisiana, first you make a roux. And that is what is the key to the gumbo, to getting it the right color, to getting it to the right taste. The next thing you gotta have is you gotta either have a very old chicken or that old duck that's hollering over there. You got to have either one of those, and it got to be old because if it's when it's old, it's tough, and when it's tough, you got to cook it a long time, and it makes a wonderful juice. If you if you don't have that, and if you live in the city, you certainly don't have it. If you you got to have a wonderful stock, which is taking bones, uh, like you see us doing here, taking bones and browning them off really hard until they get good and golden brown and put them with water, bring them to a boil, and then let them simmer for hours and hours until you have a wonderful juice to cook with. Next thing you add is cooking expertise and bell peppers and onions and celery. And you, what comes out is this rich, rich tasting, wonderful broth. It's, it's a soup, but it's not a soup. It doesn't taste like any soup you've ever had. It's a gumbo, and a gumbo has a special taste to it. All of Louisiana food we talk about has a framework of taste. And that framework of taste involves in cooking method, the brown roux. It involves in the seasoning, uh, red pepper, white pepper, black pepper, garlic, onions, bell pepper, celery, and the usage of those things. And so what we're doing is making a gumbo that tastes like you wouldn't believe. Now, I, I got some right here, but I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to get ready for this one. I mean, I'm going to just get right into it. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I, I, I like to introduce dishes this way it, because it really makes my work hard. You know I mean? Oh, when you, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just amazing to taste it. What, you, what happens is the first thing you taste is that dark root. And then as you start to swallow, you get different taste, the bell pepper, the onions that have been cooked a long time and they're kind of sweet. And then you taste the chicken, and the chicken comes through really strong. Then when you swallow, you have this wonderful glow in your mouth. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like almost pain, 
but it isn't. And, and it's, oh, it's fun. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's pleasure. I mean, it really is. And what happens to that is you want to take another bite. And I mean, the, then the chicken comes through again. The sausage comes through, the smokiness from the sausage. Uh, I think I'm going to quit talking about it and just eat. I think to, to accent any kind of cooking you do, you need a stock. Now, we've, we're doing a, going to do a chicken stock for you. We've taken the chicken bones, chicken backs, and we've browned them off till they're golden brown. Then from this point, you can just add water to it now and cover it, or you can get more taste out of it by adding carrots. And you can see we use the peelings of the carrots here. We can put celery into it and just use the tops. So use, the, use the bottom, the root of the celery that you would ordinarily throw away, not use. Uh, put onions in it. The skin of the onion gives it a nice tone and color, plus the onion taste. You can put garlic, and you can use whole cloves of garlic, or you can use garlic leaves or whatever. And it's, it's nice to fill the pot up. Don't put it over full like I just did. But you cover this with water, and you bring it to a boil and let it simmer. Now, if you want to, you can reduce that by not adding water to it and leaving it on a nice simmer, and it'll make you a gelatin. It'll make you a glaze. Or you can just keep adding water and cook it for 24 hours and get this wonderful taste that'll just make everything you cook so much better. Just bring it to a ball and let it simmer. A gumbo is a very emotional thing for me because there are so many times that I remember eating gumbo that are memorable times in my life. Um, I'll try to relate some of those to you as we go along but let's get to cooking. The first thing we got to do is you got to season and brown the chicken off. Now, uh, it's important to season every step of the way. I mean, everything you do, if you want uh, what you're cooking to have multiple tastes or to have a taste constantly changing as you eat it and with each bite, and if you want the last bite to be as good or better than the first one, you, you've got to season every step of the way. And this is what you see us doing. First, we season the chicken. Now we're going to put some on the flour that's going to go in the chicken. Now, my philosophy is that you don't want to take something as bland as flour and put it on the on the, the surface of chicken because you're going to just take away from the taste. Now, it won't make a great deal of difference. But the fact is, is that if you add seasoning to the flour it, and you've already seasoned the chicken, it'll make a difference to the good. In other words, it'll make it even just a little bit better and help those taste change happen. You want to heat the oil until it's about 375 degrees because you want it really hot. What we're doing here is browning the chicken off. You don't want to cook it. It don't have to be cooked. You want to take it and get it a good golden brown color. You know, I remember at times in my life when when I was uh, when I was gone in high school and and my friends and I used to uh, go to my uncle's service station an all night restaurant in Opelousas, Louisiana, and I mean one of the things we had was gumbo. One of it's one of the things we could afford because at the time you could get gumbo for a dollar seventy five or dollar fifty a whole bowl, and I mean it was two or three o'clock in the morning and you had been out all night with your girl and you know you ran out of mud and you could go over there and just get a big bowl of gumbo for a dollar and a half. Here we're browning the chicken off and we turn it over and you see what you want is that just you you putting taste on the chicken by browning it. You're giving it, you put the skin down first into the skillet and you you get the fat off of the skin into the into the oil by browning it off but you also add dimension to the taste by making the nuttiness of the flour of browning the flour which makes a nutty taste to it and so what we're doing is throughout making this gumbo you'll see us do things to add to the taste now the the most important thing probably in my head to the taste of gumbo is the roux and a roux is flour and oil that's cooked at a high temperature until it retains a color now see what we've done here we brown the chicken off and we left the bottom dregs from browning the chicken, all the little pieces of flour and all the fat from the chicken that went into the oil. We, we tried to leave that into the bottom of the skillet because we're accenting the taste. Now, we're adding flour to it and we're taking the flour that we used to dip the chicken in, the seasoned flour, and add it to it. You can see the little seasonings in there. I mean, you can see the, the red pepper and the black pepper and so on. Now, you, you see, constantly building taste on top of taste at different points to make those tastes just constantly change and to me that's what a great gumbo is. Now making the roux is a is an intricate 
really important part because if you burn this flour and oil, if you get it too dark or too black, it's going to be bitter. And once it's bitter, you can forget it. I mean, it's gone. But it, it is also the key to the taste of it. Now, when it's a color brown like it is now, it's going to have a nutty taste and it's going to have an influence, but not as great. And it's going to thicken because of the color. Now, when you get a darker brown, it's going to thicken less and it's going to have more of an in, a taste influence on it. So what I'm saying to you is that this part watch carefully and this part try to duplicate as much as you can I see we're getting see the color just changed now we're getting darker it's almost like a it's kind of like a red brown now I want to stop the color I want to stop the cooking process so I'm adding onions and bell pepper and celery to it and I've shut off the fire and I'm also going to add now I've got seasoning in it I've got the bell, uh, the, the, the seasoned mixture that was in the flour along with the onions and bell pepper and celery. Now you can just smell this. I mean, the smell is just awesome. Now what I've done, I've taken bland flour and oil that I've already cooked the chicken into that has a chicken taste and I've combined the taste together to give me a just incredible strong taste to add to my gumbo. And it, it, I've got the juice of the bell pepper and the juice of the onions and the seasoning in this with the nutty taste of the flour. Now, when I'm going to add this to the stock, and you can see how that stock turned out really nice and rich with a, a little brown color to it. Now, I'm going to start adding the roux to it. Now, this roux has, is the only thing that's going to be everywhere in this gumbo. See, as I add it to it, so it starts dissipating and little pieces running all over. Now, as I whisk it, it's going to become a part of that juice, a part of the stock. And that part is going to be in every spoonful. So what I've taken is I've taken onions, bell pepper, and celery, and I've taken a mixture of herbs and spices, and I've taken flour and oil and turned it into the greatest influence in this gumbo. I mean, the greatest influence it has because it's now everywhere. As this boils, the flour is dissipated and become a part of the gumbo. Now I want to build the taste of chicken, and so I'm adding the chicken that I've browned off to it and the particles that are nuttiness that's on the surface of the chicken and a little bit of seasoning that's on the surface is going to also get into the gumbo and add to the taste and see what I'm doing is I'm building dimensions and taste building stages of taste to it and it's just got to continue now we're going to add the sausage to it now the, uh, the sausage has a smokiness I mean the smokiness that is going to come in after the after you've taken a bite and you swallow, you're going to feel the smokiness in it and you're going to feel the pepper in it. Now, we're going to add onions and bell pepper and celery another time. Now, see, we've got some that's already cooked into the flour and oil or into the roux. Now, they're going to have a taste and texture of their own. Now, we're adding more to it. We're adding more onions and bell pepper and celery fresh again to it to give it a crunchiness. So, to give it that second and third and tenth dimension in taste. We're going to add fresh garlic and we've added more herbs and spices to it because right in here I checked it, I tasted it and I felt like it needed more seasoning. Now <clears throat> what do you have to do at this point is bring it to a boil and let it come to a nice rapid simmer. Now when that happens an oil is going to start forming on the surface. Now this is the oil that the flour is released when you made the roux. In other words, the flour can only hold so much oil, so it releases some. So this is part of making a gumbo. You have to stop and skim it. And if you let it roll, like you see this simmer rolling, and then the oil is going to collect on one side of the pan, and then you just take it and just scoop it right off. And see, you have the roux that's, that's a brown color, and you notice that at some point it got started to get black after you put the vegetables in. Now that's an artificial thing when you see it start to get black, because once you put it with the stock, you can see how it's still just a rich, really nice brown color to it. Now I'm telling you, this is, oh, I'm going to taste this. Good, this is good. All it's got to do now is just simmer. It's alive. It's wonderful gumbo. You can just see all the taste in it. Me a bowl of potato salad, put some rice on it, and pour the gumbo to it! No Cajun table is complete without its own set of condiments. Everybody does their own. 
Uh, you have pickle pepper vinegars, you have pepper vinegars, you have Creole mustards, you have mustard sauces, and it just goes on and on, all kind of pepper sauces. They're wonderful to add to the food. In closing, I'd like to say to you that get your own pepper vinegars. Get your own table condiments when you're doing Cajun. We appreciate y'all joining us. We hope you had a good time. And remember, if somebody serves you something and it don't taste good, it's not Cajun. <laughs> Yeah.